In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground. And that place is called Calvary. And that person is called Jesus. Grateful to be here. Turn in your Bibles to Jonah chapter 1. Jonah chapter 1. I do appreciate the invitation to be here. I love your pastor and his wife and his family. Been friends a long time now. I, I was joking with a few minutes ago with Timmy. I talked to Dale today by text, and I, I said, I hope you set the bar real low so they won't be disappointed. You're going to finish with a bang with Josh Phillips. For my money, and this is the truth, he's as good a preacher as we have in the Southern Baptist Convention now, week in, week out. I listen to him all the time online. Josh Phillips. He's a tremendous expositor of the Word of God. He's my best friend. We talk almost every day. I love you. Jonah chapter 1. It's good to have my friends with me, the Andrews, tonight. We've been friends a long time, and I love them. And they've been great friends and supporters for over 20 years now. This is my 21st year as a pastor. <laughs> I started pastoring when I was 23. True story. I probably should have got fired those first two or three years. You can remember those days, Timmy, oh, Lord, man, I said some stuff back then. I look back, oh, my goodness. The sermons were really bad then. They're not much better now, but they were really bad then. Jonah chapter 1, let me ask you to stand if you're physically able to reverence the reading of God's holy, inspired, infallible, inerrant word. The Bible says, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Hamittai, saying, arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Let's pray together. Father, for your word, we're eternally grateful. Father, I pray, God, that you'll speak to us. Help us, God, to rightly divide the word of truth. Your word is truth without any mixture of error. Speak now. We'll listen. For us in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I want to preach tonight on the subject matter of how sweet the sound. One of the more interesting fads of our, of our day and the teenagers, I'm getting old and I, and I recognize that because I don't fit in with some of the stuff and some of the current trends now. But one of the more recent fads, of, in my opinion, is those head, popularity of the headphones that the kids wear now. I'm a little bit ashamed to tell you we have a couple of pairs of those at my house. I have a 17-year-old and a 12-year-old. A few years ago, Time Magazine published an article that said how Dr. Dre made $300 headphones a must-have accessory. Now, you heard me right, $300 for a pair of headphones. Those cost $100 or more that particular year, increased in sales from, by 73%. Now, here's where I'm on. It looks like we've got a lot of young folks walking around having a hearing test all the time now with them things on. You know what I'm saying? And it's just, it just really doesn't make sense to me. And maybe some of you have those things, and, and we're paying more for headphones than many folks paid for their first car now. Can I get a witness? Y'all remember that? The marketing pitch behind those headphones is, is the sound is so much better than the headphones that were produced before. Apparently hundreds of dollars better. I personally think it's just kind of a fad and a status symbol that's going to pass in time. But I do think that, that, that that's kind of interesting. But there is something to be said for hearing things clearly and appreciating what's truly being said. 
Now, the book of Jonah that we find ourselves in tonight in our text, as we come to that, is is a a small book of the Bible. And I I spent some time looking at this a few years ago, and God has really spoke to my heart, even afresh again today through this. And the Bible tells us that the Lord spoke to a prophet by the name of Jonah, and he commissioned him to go to preach in the big city of Nineveh. Now, Jonah obviously didn't think so, But hearing from God should have been a sweet sound in his ear. He should have recognized the grace of God in that call that came to him. One writer said this, an evangelist said this, Grace is any move of God in our direction. Whenever God begins to reveal himself to us and speak to us, to communicate with us, it's indeed, ladies and gentlemen, even on a Monday night in 2019, that's still an act of grace. Amazing grace. And when God speaks to you and God speaks to me, then it ought to be a a sweet sound to our ears. (laughs) Sometimes, though I have the idea, I've been doing this a long time now, Timmy, and you have too, that some folks would rather not hear from the voice of God would rather run from the voice of God than recognize the value of it. Now, sometimes we don't really want to hear what God's got to say. <laughs> now, a little book of Jonah, it's, uh, it's really not a fish story at all. It's really about revival that God sent to a nation. It's the story of a relentless, pursuing, world-changing, life-giving grace of God. It's what the story's about. And it begins... <laughs> With the sound of his voice. Well, I don't have a lot of time with you tonight. I'm going to drive home tonight, so you need to listen fast. Y'all all right? Timmy told me I could only preach two hours. And two hours, I hope to be a long ways towards Salisbury. Are you all right? But now, the, the Bible, first of all, I want you to see in our text, it is grace when God speaks his word to us. Now, if you're a student of the Old Testament at all, you quickly recognize that Jonah's one of the minor prophets. There's 12 minor prophets. Eight of those begin with some reference to the word of the Lord came to that prophet. Now, the opening verse of Jonah says, Now, the Lord, word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai. If I didn't pronounce that right, I don't know what baby book they found that in. But if you're not careful in reading that, you'll read it so quickly you'll miss the blessing of what God has said in His Word to us from that text. It's not the name of the prophet at all that's important here. It's the fact that God is choosing to speak to him. Now, ladies and gentlemen, you've got to pay attention here and and watch this quickly. One writer said this, a more significant miracle than Jonah being alive in a fish is that God has chosen to speak To humanity. I I think sometimes we forget the wonder of all this thing, ladies and gentlemen, and we step away from it just a little while. We ought to step back sometimes, Brother Timmy, just think that the God of heaven, who came from nowhere, stood on nothing and made everything, He, in His mercy and His grace, chooses to speak to us. God doesn't, we hear people say, but God, if God doesn't do this, he's going to owe Sodom and Gomorrah apology. God's under no obligation to do anything he doesn't want to do. God in his mercy chose to speak to Jonah. God in his mercy chose to speak to you. (laughs) For God to speak to Jonah, for God to speak to you is an act of grace. Sometimes I think we forget that. That God is an act of grace that He speaks to us at all, and that secondly, that He He even wants to actually communicate with us. Notice with me here: it's an act of grace, first of all, because of His of His initiative. Now, I want you to pay very close attention to what the text does not say. The text does not say that Jonah sought God. So it says, the text says the word of the Lord came to who? Jonah. <laughs> 
That means that God started the conversation. That means that God took the initiative. That means God reached out to Jonah before God, Jonah reached out to God. The fact of the matter is, ladies and gentlemen, tonight, if you and I will step back and see the story of Jonah, it has the story of humanity as a whole, especially those who know the Lord God as their Savior. You see, Jonah wasn't asking God for something to do. <laughs> That's not the narrative says. He wasn't begging God for this mission. It's the fact of the matter is, is that God came to him first. That's your story too. And the fact is, is, ladies and gentlemen, the reason I got saved on a Monday night at a revival meeting is because God came to where I was sitting. Let me tell you how it went down. My mama come in from the meal that day. She said, well, the choir sing the night at church. I said, okay, at revival. She said, and you're going. I said, mama, mama, you don't understand. I went to church twice yesterday. And she said, I'm listening. And I said, I don't want to go tonight. I went yesterday. And I was 15 and I knew everything. Y'all right? And she said, well, I hear what you're saying. But what you need to do is go to your room get some clothes on. Because we're going to church tonight. The choir singing. And you're going. I said, well, I'm not going to like it. She said, you may not like it. But you're going. By the way, this is free. This is not needing the notes. I don't understand for the life of me why parents let kids decide whether they come to church or not. I mean to tell you, we make them brush their teeth. We make them take, go to school. We make them do homework. We make ours go to bed at a certain time. But we won't make them go to church. Well, preacher, we can't force it down their throat. We're forcing everything else down their throat. Last week, I told my daughter, I said, you've got to do this for me. She said, I don't want to go. I said, okay. She said, so, okay, we're good. I said, well, you're still going. I don't know why you've been wasting that breath. You're going. <laughs> Last night, I told my oldest one. I said, do your homework. She said, daddy, it's Sunday. I said, is the assignment due by midnight? Tonight? Yes. And you submitted online? Yes. I said, have you done it? No. <laughs> Do your homework! <laughs> and it went about like that too. <laughs> Here's what happens, ladies and gentlemen. God came looking for me that night. And I sit on the back pew and truthfully I talked and played. But somewhere about halfway through it, the Spirit of God began to speak to my heart and put His finger right there on my life and said, it's you that doesn't know me. That night, I stood on part, come to this side of the church as a smaller church. The piano was on the floor. And that night, I knelt and gave my heart and my life to Jesus. If you study the Bible, Adam and Eve didn't go looking for God. God came looking for them. If you look at the Bible, the Bible says that Adam and Eve were in the garden and they were running and trying to hide and cover up the mess they were in. Yet God came looking for them. Aren't you thankful tonight that God came looking for you? He called you by name that day. He knew your name. He spoke to you. He took the initiative in your life. And ladies and gentlemen, it was an act of grace that He done so. In America, we're running around trying to say what well, this, and we got rights to this, and all that kind of stuff. The fact of the matter is, if we all get what's coming to us, we'll die and spend eternity in hell. But thank the Spirit of God, God didn't give us what I got coming to me. I get grace and mercy. Aren't you thankful? Think about this. The Bible describes us as sheep. Have you ever thought about that, how insulting that really is? Seriously. Sheep are dumb. They stink. They stray. And that's what the God of heaven said we are. We're sheep. He knows, he knows me. The fact of the matter is sometimes I'm dumb. Don't ask my kids. They think I'm all the time dumb. I remember Timmy told me that one time. I didn't believe him. I, didn't, I do now. Ooh. Aren't you thankful that the God of heaven called you a sheep and he left the rest of the flock to seek after your life? He loved you enough to seek you where you're at. God in his mercy came to where you at looking for you. He called you by name and changed your life. That, sir, that, ma'am, is an act of grace. It was not the word of Jonah that came to the Lord. It was the word of the Lord that came to Jonah. God took the initiative and he was gracious to do so. But see, secondly, though, I, it, was, it was grace because of that, but because of his initiative, but also because of his identity. I want you to pay very close attention here. We've not left our text yet. We're still in verse 1. Now the word of the Lord. Now you'll find the word Lord there is capitalized. Capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That's important there for us to find that. 
This is a way of God signifying that that's not just a title for God, but it's actually His actual name. The name of God of Israel was, this was the name of God of Israel, the one who's the true God. The Jews considered the name of God so sacred and holy to actually write it out, they would then substitute it and say Adonai. In its place, it means Lord. And that's how we end up with this word Lord in our text. It's the personal name of God. That's His name He uses to communicate to those folks who know Him. And my first name is Richard. If you call my house and ask to speak to Richard, I'm going to say you've called the wrong number. My daddy's Richard. Richard lives in Rockingham, but my name is Scott. My personal name. You don't know me if you called me Richard. My friends call me Scott. He uses this name and those people who enters, he enters a covenant with. Jonah, the man that God spoke to in this was verse 1, was one of the people of Israel, and he was one of the prophets. <laughs> but with that said, Jonah was a flawed man. So this book's going to bear out if you, if you know the rest of the story. As flawed as he was, now think about this though, think this through, think it through. As flawed as he was, the God of heaven is choosing to reveal himself to this flawed, wicked, reluctant prophet by his personal name. As flawed and as wicked and as bad as you are when no one else, God knows what you think, God knows what you are when no one else is looking, and God still chooses to reveal himself to you what an incredible act of grace (laughs) ladies and gentlemen think of the grace of this one writer said this God is not required by any condition or circumstance to make himself known to anyone at any time the fact of the matter is God didn't have to speak to Jonah he chose to God didn't have to speak to any of us Preacher, that would make him a bad God. I recognize what the Bible teaches that salvation is for everybody, but that, there was no reason for God had to start with it to put that in the Bible. <laughs> it was an act of grace. God revealed himself to us first in the creation, <laughs> didn't he? Then he's revealed himself to us in his word. Then through his own son, Jesus who sent to the world. God didn't have to come talk with any of us. He didn't have to reveal himself to us, yet he has chosen to do so. The fact is, is we're like Jonah, and it's grace that God speaks to us this day and time. Ladies and gentlemen, don't miss the fact, it's grace when God speaks his word to us. Every once in a while we'll have somebody come to church. <laughs> Y'all don't have this issue here, Timmy. I'm sure down in Harnett County, you're more holy down here. But in Rowan County, sometimes we, we had one come not too awful long ago, and they said, well, they were never coming back. I said, why? No one speak to you? No, everybody was friendly. But when I left there, I felt so guilty. And I thought to myself, that's good preaching. We didn't come to you to feel good about yourself. The fact of the matter is there's not that much good about any of us anyway. The fact is is that God in His mercy chose to speak to you that day about your sin. He called you to Himself. It's not a pretty picture if you start comparing yourself to Jesus. What happens in our society though, people will say, the preacher, I'm a good man or I'm a good woman. And then what they'll do is they'll compare themselves to society's worst element. You go to Central Prison in Raleigh, like most of us look pretty good. I love your pastor, but I love his wife more. I'm being serious, and she's pretty holy, I think. But if you compare her to Jesus, she doesn't look as good as she thought she did. And she's holier than he is. And if you compare us all to Jesus, my brother, we don't look so good, do we? It's grace that God chooses to reveal himself to us. Let me give you a second thought here, though. Got to hurry. You're not listening fast enough. 
is grace when God speaks His word to us. But I think it's grace when God shows His will to us. In verse 1, the word of the Lord came to Jonah. That's grace, right? What was that word that came? Turns out God wanted Jonah to do something. More grace. I have to tell you the story. It's really funny. My brother's a postmaster. and A few years ago, he was working in our hometown of Wadesburg where Timmy used to come. And Well, we weren't all that godly back then, but we'll leave that alone. We didn't claim to be preachers then. But this person come to the window. He was working there at the post office. And they said, well, you're here. And they said, yeah. He, he said, I've been at the post office 25 years, whatever it is. And, and where's your sister at? Well, she's a nurse practitioner in Charlotte. And the guy kind of swallowed hard. And he said, well, where's Scott at? Well, he's a preacher in Tyler City at the time. The guy said, no, no, I'm serious. <laughs> Folks, it was grace that God spoke to me on February 25th, 1991. It was more grace in November of 1993 when I said, God, yes, I'll go. To wherever you send and wherever you lead, I'll go. You see, we act like sometimes we're doing a God of a favor if we were willing to do what he's asked us to do. The fact is, that's an act of grace. As if God needed you anyway. I know preachers that say, well, if I quit, the church will fall apart. Folks, do you recognize that Jesus done without you for a long time? And the Lord's still on the throne tonight as ever he ever was. And he doesn't need me. He doesn't need Timmy. He doesn't need you. He chooses to let you, sir, or you, ma'am, serve in the capacities you're serving for the kingdom of kings. God doesn't have to have me, and God doesn't have to have you. God chooses to do that, and that's grace. Turns out God wanted him to do something. Well, verse 2, we're, we're still in our text. We're not left our text. We're not going to lose our text. He says to arise and go to Nineveh, that great city, and crowd against it. Turns out God had a work to do beyond the borders of Israel. And he wanted him to go do an international work. I'm grateful God's not called me to do that. Sometimes you'd think it is if you live here in North Carolina. But the fact is, it's gracious of God to allow any of us to work in the work of the Lord. But some folks don't see the work of God as gracious and good, though, do they? It's grace when God shows His will to us. I'm going to show you that two ways. First of all, even when it's difficult for us. Now, I want you to pay close attention to our text when we read what the text says of the will of God involved in Jonah's life. The Bible says in verse 2, verse, the very first verse, word there, arise. That means he's going to have to get up from where he's currently at and go somewhere. Now, I'm not the sharpest drawer, knife in anybody's drawer tonight, and I'm not even a smart guy, but I'm telling you when he said get up, arise, that means he's going to have to move his feet to get to where he was going. Are you following what I'm telling you? Maybe, just maybe, I don't know this, but we're going to have to speculate a little bit tonight. He was comfortable where he was. Maybe he had family there. For the first time in my ministry, in over 20 years, I live near my wife's family. I live an hour and a half to two hours from mine. But I believe God called me where I serve at currently. Maybe life was going fairly well for him in that place. Yet God was calling him to get up from that place and go to another place. This is going to be difficult and to the very least it's going to be disruptive to his life. But he's going to have to do what God said to do. It's fascinating to me. In the last 10 years, me and Timmy have talked about this a little bit. Some preachers now have the idea, God, I'll go anywhere you want me to go if I can live in this house. And I can stay this close to my mama, but I'm not going to go anywhere you call me because I'm just not going to move my furniture. That's not exactly how the call of God works. Let me explain this to you. A number of years ago, me and Mike Whitson was sitting around a table and this preacher was telling him, he said, I'm just telling you right now, there's some stuff I'm just not going to do. I was just sitting there listening. Because I could see preacher Mike's face begin to turn. I thought, this is fixed to be good. After he told Preacher Mike what he was and what's not going to do for 15 or 20 minutes, Preacher Mike said, can I say something to you speaking to your life and help you, young man? 
I thought, I need to get on the edge of my seat for this. This is going to be good. This is going to help you too, folks. You give up the right to tell God what you were and were not going to do the day you trusted Jesus as your personal Savior. It was that day that you were purchased and bought with a price and so therefore, you must do what God said to do. Jonah, arise. Get up. It's going to be disruptive. You're going to have to do something different. It's not your, your idea, but it's still an act of grace that God's going to use him over there. Preacher, I don't want to go over there. Do you think Jonah wanted to go to Nineveh? It's an act of grace that God would use him, though. Hmm. Calling is going to be difficult. Now, our day, folks talk about finding the will of God like it's a bunch of Easter eggs that they can't find. It is my fear, and this is my conviction, that many folks, what they really want to do is consult God about their lives and ask God for His advice. Hoping they can get along better with their kids, find a better job, and figure out which house to buy. They really don't want God inter interrupting their plans and stepping into their lives and saying, No, sir, you'll move your furniture across this state, across this world, to do what I said to do. For the biggest part of my adult life, I spent, I was these two guys' pastor. True story. And I've come to the conviction in recent days that I was right to leave. And, and me and Mike Whitson talked about this recently. He said, listen to me. The Bible says that Jesus led the disciples into a storm. I had the roughest 15, years of my, 15 months of my life. What was crazy was for the four months I spent on Mike Whitson's staff shortly thereafter, I met the men, two of the men who are helping me in my ministry the most right now, started a sports ministry and my music ministry. Only God could have seen all that behind the scenes all those times. I'm telling you what is true. Do I beg God for 15 months of sitting the pulpit committee? God, anywhere, I'll go anywhere you send me. It's amazing how everything fell together, though, in the fall of 2017 for me to go to the place I serve at now. Only God could have done that. But even when it's difficult for us, you still have to do what God said to do. Y'all right, church? Well, we don't want God to turn our world upside down like this stuff, you know. Well, see, what most people want to do is God lead them when it's a step ladder up success, not a hill, a hill to a cross. <laughs> we want God to use us as long as it's convenient and everything else is going on in our life. Not too difficult or too disruptive to our agendas. Listen to me, friend. The will of God is gracious and good for you even when it causes you to lose that which you call precious and your own life's sake. Jesus said, count the cost and go anyway. And the truth is, the will of God will never lead you or the grace of God can't keep you. There's nothing so difficult the will of God that he's not proved his grace to you in that process. I have to give you a second thought. Y'all aren't listening nearly fast enough. Even when it's disagreeable to us. Now listen to what the text says. We're still in our text. We're not with our text yet. Arise and go to Nineveh, that great city. Now, when you read Nineveh now, we've heard about it since we were kids, and it really doesn't mean that much to us. But now we're talking about God speaking to an Israelite to go talk to the Ninevites, who are the Assyrians. Nineveh is the capital city of the Assyrian capital, empire. Now, that burgeoning world power at the time, and eventually the nation would carry away the people of God as slaves into Israel and Jonah's home country. I don't know this. This is speculation. But maybe, just maybe, Jonah could read the tea leaves, so to speak, and realize that Israel kept on the path they were going. God's going to use the Assyrians to help judge them, and he did. We know that to be history fact. What is interesting to me, though, is God's going to send them a preacher. And God's going to reach out to the Assyrians before he judged them. Jonah didn't think that was a good idea. He didn't like that idea too much. Jonah didn't even think so, but, but God's will was good for his life. Jonah didn't think showing mercy to Nineveh was a good, good idea. Now, now I've just, I'm, just, I'm not meddling, I'm just preaching. Just listen to me. I wonder if God's will included you going to your worst enemy and ministering to them, could you do it? I'm just saying. 
I remember when Saddam Hussein was hung a few years ago and, and people were on Facebook putting on, I hope he burns in hell. And, and I remember Ashlyn, that was small at the time, said to me, Daddy, don't we all deserve to go to hell? I think it would have been better for Saddam Hussein to say, folks, trust Jesus before it's too late. Because there's not hell number one, hell number two. The good old boy goes to the same place as Saddam Hussein is there tonight. You should do that because Jesus said, love your enemies, do good to them which hate you. St. Patrick, some of you know the story of St. Patrick of, of Ireland. But the truth is he wasn't born in Ireland. He was born in England. And he was kidnapped by pirates as a young man and carried away to Ireland as a slave. Eventually, St. Patrick managed to escape and make it back to England to his family. True story. But what's funny is, is the Lord began to do a work in his heart. <laughs> Begin to speak to him and he saved him and he changed him. And guess where God called him to? Ireland. Back to that same place he'd been abused and mistreated and all that kind of stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, I've been doing this a long time now. And I'm past the place where I'm going to tell God what I am and I'm not going to do. I have some things I would rather not do. I have some th- places I'd rather not go. But if God says go, I will not get out of the will of God. I'm going to do what he said to do. Here's the point. When God's will crosses your will, your natural inclination is not to do that. But the fact of the matter is God's still gracious and good and and right to let you be a part of what He's doing and you do well to do what He said to do and and put your will on the side and go ahead. You're all right? God is gracious to call you in the first place to include you in His plans for the redemption of other lost men, women, boys, and girls. Boy, you ought to just thank the God of heaven He'd allow you to be a part of that. You start stepping back from this, Timmy. We've been preaching a long time. We get to, that God would use us at all, knowing all He knows about what we used to be, where we come from in our lives. The, the God of <laughs> would mercy would use us to impact eternity on His behalf. That is an act of grace. <laughs> well, let me give you a third thought. If you'll listen to me about ten more minutes, we'll be gone. Because I'm sweating now. <coughs> It's grace when God speaks His word to us. It's grace when God shows His will to us. Thirdly, it's grace when God gives, sends His warnings to us. Verse 2. We're still in verse 2. We've not left it. Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and crowd against it, for their wickedness have come up before me. God's doing the talking now. Jonah's the prophet, but God's doing the talking. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, listen. Now, if you are Jonah, <coughs> he knows the future of the Assyrians as an invading army. This mission wasn't very exciting. But let's put the shoe on the other foot. Let's say you're a citizen of Nineveh. Aren't you thankful somebody came to where you were at? <coughs> Aren't you thankful tonight that the God of heaven chose to speak to where you were at? You see, had God only chose good-looking folk, your pastor would have got left out. (laughs) Think of this through, though. The God of the Israelites is sending a preacher to warn you and confront you with your sin and tell that you're going to die. That is grace. A few years ago, I assigned myself in the summertime. I was going to preach one Sunday on heaven and one Sunday on hell. Y'all remember when I did that? You know how hard it is to find about five or six sermons on heaven? The ones on hell and judgment were easy to find. What's your point? The point is this. It's an act of grace that God would tell you, sir. It's an act of grace that God would tell you, ma'am, that if you don't trust Jesus as your personal Savior, you will die and spend eternity in hell. That's not popular preaching this day and time. It doesn't make it any less true. John the Baptist stood before the religious leaders of his day and the political leaders of that, those that, that day and said it's not lawful if you have another man's wife. 
It didn't burn him any brownie points in town, but it still was the truth of the Word of God. It's an act of grace that God would say, don't do that. It's an act of grace that we preach that stuff. Sometimes as Baptists, we're known for more what we're against than what we're for. The fact of the matter is we're unashamedly against a few things. When you start wanting to redefine that, which God's already defined by way of marriage, homosexuality in any form is a sin before a holy and a righteous God. But so is adultery and so is premarital sex. And God's people ought to hear that too. Somehow we give a wink and a nod to those other two and act like it's not a big deal. It's just as offensive to the nostrils of God. We've taken something beautiful that God made for a man and a woman in a marriage covenant and put that on an animal's level. Y'all all right? Don't shout me down because I'm preaching good now. Some folks don't like God sticking His nose into their lives and pointing out things that are wrong. Some folks don't like that. But God did do that. Ron Dunn, was, he's in heaven now, one of my favorite preachers. Timmy's heard him before, too. He'd sometimes just sigh. He'd say something like this. I wish that wasn't in there. But it is. Their wickedness has come up before me. It's a stench in the nostrils of God. I see what they're doing. <laughs> well, let me show you a couple things here. It reveals, first of all, the holiness of God. I, I don't know where we're going, even amongst preachers nowadays. Holiness seems to be a, a, a something we don't worry about anymore, just, just a byproduct. But Jonah is told to go to Nineveh and do what? Cry out against it. Because their wickedness has become before me. That word cry out, that phrase cry out is very interesting. It gives the idea of speaking up in order to get someone's attention. One writer said this was, God was calling John to shout none of his evil aloud for the entire world to hear. I really want folks to like me. I do. I, I, that's my personality. I like folks to like me. I like being liked. But I don't want folks to like me so good they'll come to our church and feel so good about their sin they'll go die and go to hell. You all right? I, I love your pastor. He don't want that either. The fact is, he's not afraid to preach the Bible to you. He's preached the Bible faithfully to you for 30 some odd years now. He was 12. I was 12 when he came. He's old. <laughs> Jonah was to raise a fuss in Nineveh because why? The Lord said their wickedness has come up before me. Literally their wickedness was in the face of God and he'd seen what they'd done and he called their wickedness out. Now, Scripture here does not describe what it is but we know from the Assyrians they were a violent and a savage group of people. The prophet Nahum calls it the men of the bloody city. History tells that the Syrians would literally desecrate the bodies of their conquered foes, tearing their lips off, skinning folks alive, and piling their bones up as a monument to their greatness. Preacher, they got by with it. No, they didn't either. The Bible says that their weakness has come up before me. Ladies and gentlemen, make no mistake, God's keeping good score. His hands are firm on the steering wheel. Sometimes you want to see God give out a little Old Testament justice to the Supreme Court when they do crazy stuff. But I'm telling you, God is keeping score. One of these days, He will. I don't know the full nature of their wickedness. I don't, because the text doesn't say. But it's obvious it's an offense to an absolute holy God. These pagan Assyrians didn't know their, this God. They didn't know the God of Abraham, Isaac, or Jacob. They weren't given the law from Sinai. They were carved on tablets by the very finger of Almighty God. And yet the God of the Sinai, their, their creator, nonetheless, and in grace, chose to reveal His holiness to them by sending a prophet and a preacher to tell them, what you're doing is sin, and you better get right with God. That doesn't sound like grace to me. I know this. It was grace when I knew that my sin would cause me to go to hell. It's grace that I recognize the fact that my sin separates me from a holy God. Preacher, that doesn't sound like grace at all. Oh, it's grace. You see, our greatest enemy is that we got to make sure we get folks lost before we can ever get them saved. 
I had to recognize I didn't know God and needed God. And that day when God changed my life, it was because I recognized how lost I was without Him. And that day, he grace meant a whole lot more to me. Have you ever listened to what you've seen? How precious did the grace appear the hour I first believed. You thought you'd take on hell with a water pistol then because grace felt was awful precious then that day. God had done a great work in your heart and your life. God sent a preacher there to tell him and it was an act of grace. In our day, the buzzword is, who are you to judge me and tell me what I'm doing is wrong? Oh, to God, people would read that in its te- context. I'm not their judge, but God is. And one of these days, when that great judgment comes, and he's spoken against their sin and, declare, and declared his holiness, that is Grace. Well, it reveals the holiness of God. I'm going to close. It reveals the heart of God. It begs the question. We come to the crescendo of the sermon, if you will. Why would God do this? Why would God warn the Assyrians about their wickedness and his judgment? Why would he do that? Because he loved them. Why not just destroy them? Why not just kill them? Jonah knew why. <laughs> he reminds us later in the book when he pounced like a young and he didn't get his way. I knew you'd do this. If I went and preached it, you'd forgive him. And that's why, folks. Why do you think your pastor stands up here labors week after week after week after week, month after month after month after month, and year after year after year? It's not so he can get paid to do this. The fact of the matter is that he does this because he loves you and he labors over you because it is grace that he's received and he's passing on more grace to you and telling you the truth. By the way, if you're wondering if I preach this way at home, I do. But the real good preacher is Wednesday night. I don't know the one tomorrow night, so I'm sure he's better than me too. God's merciful. God didn't take any pleasure in the death of the wicked. Now, every once in a while people say, well, preacher, I can't spank my children. It hurts me worse than them. Let me just help you with this. Because sometimes if it don't help them, it helps me. Are you following what I'm telling you? My little one the other day, I grabbed her by the arm and pulled her kind of close. Are y'all following what I'm telling you? I said, you woke up with teeth. Let me translate that for you. Her going to bed with him at that point was really in question. Are you following me? And then it tears me up. What do I do? Mm. I don't know how in the world I got off on that. But God delights in showing mercy, folks. Even to a bunch of savage pagans like them. And then I step back. Man, we grew up on a mill village. We were rough. Ooh, glory, we were rough. But God, in His mercy, choose to save me. You're a pastor. Hadn't always been. The fact of the matter is, I know what I'm like now sometimes. You, dri- ever, get, you ever drive much? That tests your flesh sometimes, especially in Australia 85 around Charlotte, North Carolina. I had a lady late this week wave at me, but said she'd use all her fingers. Are you following what I'm telling you? I hadn't been inside our city, but just a few weeks, years ago, and I went to grab the gas pump. It was one of those back then that shared the side, both sides, you know. This young man ripped it out of my hand. I thought, there's something within me wanting to wrap that thing around his neck. <laughs> but I can see it now. Local pastor of Salt Village Idiot. Listen, to, I'm almost done, I promise. Now God is going to confront Nineveh through a reluctant preacher with a hellfire brimstone message. With an act of grace. God sent Jonah before his wrath fell on him. Don't you think God sent a preacher for you before his wrath fell on you? Fact is, me and Timmy aren't that good tonight. Well, I'm glad God sent a preacher, aren't you, years ago? You, you heard that old gospel call? And when the invitation was given to your knee, bowed your tongue, confess that Jesus is Lord. Aren't you thankful for that tonight? God's going to 
sent Jonah before his wrath fell on him. God sent men of a time to consider the ways and turn from their sin. 2,000 years ago, God sent his word not through another preacher or prophet, but in the flesh. The Bible says the word was made flesh and he lived among us in the presence of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He didn't just call to, to, to sin, call sinners to repentance. He come to die in sinners' place. He bore their judgment in his body. He rose from the dead the third day and now as he returned back to the right hand of the Father, he's waiting on the day when he'll return as judge of all humanity. Through the scriptures, God commands every man everywhere to repent of their sins and turn to Jesus alone for their salvation. Everybody. He warns us of a wrath to come. But in mercy gives them some time to turn from their sins and be saved before that final and furious day. Now some people may not like this storyline that a God would dare to command them to bow their knees and their tongue confess to a crucified Jewish carpenter. You may not like it, but that's the way it is. And these warnings are what, class? Grace. The gift of God's Son is grace. I'm closing now. Most of you are familiar with the story of John Newton. John Newton's the author of the old hymn, Amazing Grace. <laughs> By John Newton's own admission, he was a scoundrel. He was a slave trader, a foul-mouthed, blasphemous infidel. His words, not mine. But God hunted him down. Found him in the middle of an ocean. <laughs> John Newton was gloriously saved. Later he would write, and we still sing about the day, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. Now the prophet Jonah didn't realize it. And often we don't either. But whenever God speaks to you, sir, whenever God speaks to you, ma'am, that's grace. Whatever God speaks to you is grace too. I don't always like what the preacher says. But my issue is not with the preacher. My issue is normally with me. As long as it's in the book, it's fair game. Does the word, let me ask you a question about church. Does his word sound sweet to your ears? God spoke to you about anything you didn't really want to hear? Preacher, I didn't like some of that stuff. The issue doesn't you like it or not. The issue is that an act of grace that God would tell you that stuff. He didn't tell you that stuff to be mean to you. He done that because he loves you. It is grace. Tonight, maybe you need to come trust Jesus as your personal Savior. Now, I've known your pastor a long time. I know him well enough to know he would never embarrass you for a million dollars like tonight. Not about this. He give me he does eat, give me a hard time to eat when he's hungry, but but he loves you. He he wouldn't embarrass you. Listen to me, everybody Jesus ever called, he called publicly. I'm going to ask you unashamedly to come respond to grace tonight. Maybe God's called you to do something. Well, preacher, I really don't want to do that. I don't really want to teach the kids. I don't want to work in that area. He, it's not about what you want. The question is, what's he want? fact of the matter is we've joked about this for years if we could do anything else in the world we'd be happy we would do that probably but I know this it's an act of grace that God would let me come from Wadesburg North Carolina <laughs> and the opportunities I've had to preach all over this nation do what I do it's an act of grace your pastor would have to answer that question folks tonight it's a sweet sound that the God of heaven would choose to speak to any of us. That is grace.